Soul Hackers 2. This is a game that I was extremely excited for when the announcement for the game came out. Throughout the years, I've been a huge Shin Megami Tensei fan, uh, with my love for the series actually stemming from Persona. Most fans who have been fans of the, the franchise for a long time started with Shin Megami Tensei, but personally, my first foray was Persona 3. I was uh, at a weird point in my life. I was expecting my first daughter, and I was kind of lost in gaming for quite some time. I, I didn't know what I wanted to play. I wasn't really caught up with the newest games. And around this time, it was 2010, the PS3 was out, and I didn't have one yet. Not to mention, I just wasn't really caught up with anything, really. Like, I'd been playing games, and the last game that I played, honestly, was Tales of the Abyss on my PS2. And being a huge Final Fantasy fan and just being a big JRPG fan in general, I was looking for something new, something different. And I just so happened to walk into a local GameStop in the new city that we moved to. And on the shelf was Persona 3, Persona 4, Nocturne, Digital Devil Saga 1 and 2, as well as the Atelier Iris series. So, Persona 3, for some reason, caught my eye. Maybe it was the case of the game. Maybe it was the premise of the game by looking at the back cover. I'm not sure. But I ended up buying Persona 3 and Persona 4, obviously uh, playing Persona 3 first. Once I played through Persona 3 and absolutely loved the game, I decided to then see what else Atlas as a company had to offer. Well, this kind of led me down some weird rabbit hole. Because Atlas, as a company, has a lot of games, a lot of JRPGs. And a lot of these games and a lot of these titles, honestly, are slept on. As I just went into this kind of deep dive into the company, I found myself buying games like Etrian Odyssey, Magna Carta, Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, the Digital Devil Saga games... I, you know, I, I bought another copy of Persona 3, this time being Persona 3 FES. I just started building this Atlas collection. And I haven't looked back ever since. So, coming to present day, it brings us back to Soul Hackers 2. My favorite game in the Shin Megami Tensei series or franchise, however you want to put it, for the longest time has been Shin Megami Tensei Devil Survivor on the 3DS, or originally on the DS, and then they did Overclocked on the 3DS. The first game, not the sequel that released afterwards. But that first game, the way that the storytelling was done, the way that the gameplay was, the music, everything about that game, it just made me fall in love with the franchise even more. And that was the game that for the longest time, if somebody asked me, what's my favorite Shin Megami Tensei game? I would say Devil Survivor. That changes. That changes now. With Soul Hackers 2 being able to play the game, I am just in love with this game. I love it. Everything about it, except the dungeons. We'll get there. I do want to go ahead and premise that this game was provided to me by Atlas, although I did purchase a collector's edition of the game. It's on its way. But the game was provided to me for review, uh, so I just want to go ahead and put that out there. But with that being said, they are not paying me for the review. This is not sponsored. My thoughts are my own. I will tell you what I like about it. I will tell you what I don't like about this game, because there are some things I don't like about it. But overall, I will lead with this is my favorite Shin Megami Tensei game to date. Yes, even more so than SMT5. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into Soul Hackers 2. Now, I don't want to go ahead and just talk about story stuff because... I don't want there to be spoilers in this. I want you guys to enjoy this game, play through it, enjoy it for what it is. 
Uh, because a lot of times, or not a lot of times, most times, I think 80% of the time, SMT games or Persona games are highly story-driven. Some games are character-driven, such as the Persona games, such as games like um, Digital Devil Saga, Devil Survivor, Devil Summoner. These games are typically character-driven. The mainline entries within the Shin Megami Tensei games are not character-driven. They're world-driven, meaning that the lore, the overall lore within that world, within that game, is what drives the story. That's why a lot of times for SMT games, uh, the mainline ones, like a Nocturne, uh, Shin Megami Tensei 4, Shin Megami Tensei 5, a lot of times those games don't typically resonate with a general audience because the general audience wants characters that they can fall in love with and these games typically don't have that what these games have is a choice system that determines your alignment and typically a lot of those choices appear towards the end of the game and you have your different alignments such as your good your evil chaotic neutral whatever whatever they decide to put into that game when you have your character-driven stories, you typically don't have those alignments. Uh, you might have choices that affect your ending. You might have secret endings or true endings. But typically, they don't have an impact when it comes to like choices in the game. So, like for example, and I, I'm going to use this as a comparison quite a bit. And I know that people aren't going to like me doing this, but it kind of needs to be done specifically with Soul Hackers 2. The Persona games, specifically Persona 3, 4, and 5, they have a lot of choices within those games, but none of those choices typically affects your ending. Uh, your ending that you get in those games, uh, whether it be the true endings or not, is it's shown to you like right at the very end of the game. And you're given one choice, or well, two choices at one time, and yet your decision for there will usually determine whether or not you see the true ending for the game. In games like these, they're, as I mentioned, very character driven stories. Soul Hackers 2 is a very character driven story. It's not like the mainline SMT games where the story is revolved around the world and focused on the world. Soul Hackers 2 is character driven. That is why you don't have a huge roster of characters. Unlike Final Fantasy, for example, where most Final Fantasy games, you'll have a massive roster of characters. Or a game like uh, Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel that has a tr insane amount of characters to it. When you have characters or when you have a cast of characters that large, it's very hard to actually fall in love with some of those characters because they don't get enough screen time or they don't get enough character development. In a game that has a condensed cast of characters or a game that is a very long game, then at those moments or those types of examples, you can have the moments to explore every single one of those characters. Soul Hackers 2 condenses your party. Your party consists of four members and you get the opportunity to get to know these characters. Now, there are other characters within the game, but I'm talking about the core four party members that's within this game. This is also something that's seen in games such as Digital Devil Saga 1 and 2, where you have kind of a core cast of characters, although those games have a little bit more characters, but you don't have a huge revolving door of characters, so every character typically gets their moment to shine or their backstories and they get they give us as players the opportunity to get to know these characters and to grow with these characters and to experience these characters stories this is something that that was done in huge success in my opinion in final fantasy 15 and i'm kind of glad to see that in soul hackers 2 now those of you who might be curious about the first game i will tell you you don't need to play the first game the first game in my opinion is it's just okay. Like, it's not required homework or anything. Much like uh, Devil Survivor 1 and Devil Survivor 2, you don't need to play the first one to play the second. Same thing even with 
Persona 3 and Persona 4 and Persona 5. You don't need to play the previous ones to jump into the next ones. But a game like, for example, Digital Devil Saga 1 and 2, you kind of should play the first one because it's a continuing story. Soul Hackers 2 might make references to the first game, and fans of the first game will understand those references, but it's not required homework to play the first game, so you can jump into this one if you're fresh on the Shin Megami Tensei hype. With that being said, this game is very, very newbie friendly. If you are new to the series and the franchise, this is a good jumping point to jump into. And a lot of that has to do with the combat and the game mechanics. Most Shin Megami Tensei games have what's called a press turn system where your attacks will give you extra attacks. Or if you make a mistake in combat and you use an ice attack on an enemy who is who is immune to ice or absorbs ice, you will lose turns. Same thing with the enemy. The enemy has that same press turn system. If they get a elemental attack on you, that is your weakness. Or if they get a critical hit on you, th they get extra turns. Soul Hackers 2 does not do this. Instead, the mechanic that they use here is what's called a stacking mechanic. So every time you hit an enemy's weak point, whether it be an elemental or a physical attack, you stack a demon. And we'll get to the demons in a second. You stack a demon. So stacking demons gives you an extra attack at the very end, similar to an all-out attack from Persona. Where in Persona has that uh, just one more system or that one more system where you knock an enemy down, and if the, all the enemies are knocked down, you, got, you get the all-out attack. This game, instead, you get that all-out attack even if one demon is stacked. So you get an extra attack. But the more stacks that you have, the more damage you do. It's a very easy system and, and concept to understand. Unlike the press turn system, which will take a little bit more getting used to for newbies jumping into the franchise in order to use these demons you need to have them equipped to your characters and equipping these demons will give you their strengths as well as their weaknesses so being aware of what demon has what weakness is very important to your progression and how you fight the enemies and bosses gone is the negotiation system in this game which honestly has always been kind of a weird system so i'm glad that it's not in here in order for you to get new demons there are different ways to do so you can get new demons by working through the dungeons interact or interacting with the demons but uh fighting the demons defeating the demons and then your fellow demons that you have currently in your party will be able to summon that demon for you to have them potentially join your party assuming you have space in your party as you enter a dungeon, Ringo, who is the main character in this game, not the drummer from the Beatles, but some cybernetic chick AI system thing, she's a little complicated. But she is the one who basically is in charge of the party, and when you enter a dungeon, she will summon all the demons and that's in your party, send them out across the map, and you will interact with the demons as you come across them. They will sometimes heal you, they will sometimes give you items, they will give you uh, the currency for the game, and as I mentioned, they will be able to give you demons by summoning them, and then the demon will go ahead and either join your party for free, or sometimes ask for items, or ask for some health, or mana, or MP in this game. So, depending on if you have space, and depending on if you give up those things, the demon will join you. If you have a full party, then instead of the demon joining you, they will give you an item or they'll give you some currency. If you already have that demon in your party, same thing. They will give you currency or they'll give you an item. You cannot have duplicates of the same demon within your party. And why would you? You can hold up to 12 different demons in your party that can be swapped to any of your four characters. And Ringo conveniently is able to learn an ability that allows you to swap these demons during combat. 
which can help quite a bit if you accidentally go into a boss fight with the wrong demons. Ringo also learns various other abilities that she can activate by pushing one button and choosing which ability you want to activate at that time. One of the most important ones is allowing you to stack extra demons. And the stacks are determined by whether you hit the weaknesses of the enemy and how much damage you do at that moment. So the more damage you're doing and hitting the elemental weakness, instead of stacking one, you could stack two at, at one time, or you could stack three or four at one time. Allowing you to get massive stacks and do a tremendous amount of damage on that final hit. Characters can also learn different abilities that affect your your traversing in the dungeons. So for example, one of the characters can learn an ability to slow enemies down because enemies throughout the dungeon are objects that you can see and avoid if you don't want to go into combat. The map themselves can get a little tedious. There's different locations for the different dungeons. And there's also a side dungeon to develop your other party members. These side dungeons are important to the characters because they also tell more of those characters' stories, as well as once reaching certain gates, unlocks different abilities for those characters. The dungeon, unfortunately, gets very stale and repetitive. This is, a, this is something that I don't like in this game, and this is something that, honestly, dungeon crawlers in general have this problem it's it's a common issue that you don't really see too many solutions for like persona 4 for example did a good job with keeping things different by having each dungeon be themed persona 5 kept up that trend but persona 5 also has mementos and mementos is kind of a boring dungeon where this one again has the different dungeons that you interact with throughout the regular map and then has the side dungeon the side dungeon being the equivalent to mementos from persona 5 making it a very long drawn out boring dungeon that doesn't really change much the other dungeons on the other hand are dungeons that you interact with through the story and honestly they're just okay they're set pieces uh the longer a dungeon is, the more bored and tired you can get of those dungeons. Which, I know I said this is my new favorite Shin Megami Tensei game, and that is a big problem. But, the combat for me is so much fun that I ended up fighting pretty much every demon that I came across. Unless I was extremely low on health and MP. And then, at that point, I would smack the enemies away using Ringo's sword and avoid the enemies. But during your travels in the dungeons, there are elite enemies, which basically are enemies that are much higher level than you. And if you run into them, you can't knock them out. Instead, your attack before going into combat just pushes them back. And it's highly recommended that you just run away at that point because they will stomp you like you will die which I have done many times. And to say that this is one of the easiest ones to jump into, it's also still very punishing in a Shin Megami Tensei way. If you are new to Shin Megami Tensei, then maybe you don't know, but SMT games tend to be unforgiving when you make mistakes. This game is no exception, unless you are playing on an easier difficulty and you're playing just for the story. Something that this game does that other games don't typically do in the Shin Megami Tensei franchise is give you the, diff the different difficulty options. Sometimes Shin Megami Tensei games might give you two different options, sometimes three, but rarely do they give like a very easy difficulty. This is one of those games that gives you a way out. If you want to play very easy, you can play very easy. You want to play normal, you can play normal. If you want to play the hardest difficulty, you can play the hardest difficulty. And you can change those difficulties through your game. Similar to how you can do it in like a Tales of game. Which is okay. I mean, if you're having a hard time at a boss and you don't want to be stuck at the boss for a good while because you can't figure out how to defeat him, 
which by the way every enemy has a weakness so just finding out the weakness and being able to equip demons that are resistant to your enemy's attacks is kind of key here just giving you a little tip but you could set the difficulty to the easiest setting and just stomp the enemy there's always that option if you are ever stuck the game doesn't really give you any more rewards for playing on a harder difficulty so it's just personal preference i guess at that moment now besides finding demons throughout the map you can also fuse or other demons. This is something that is a staple and always has been a staple within the Shin Megami Tensei franchise as well as Persona. Being able to fuse demons to create new demons and carry over the abilities. Sometimes those abilities can include resistances which are very crucial if you for example have a demon that is weak to electricity and you fuse to create that demon and one of the demons that you use in the fusion has resist electricity well now the new demon that was supposed to be weak to electricity now has a resistance to it being able to customize your demons that way adds for a bit of strategy but always keep in mind that adding things like that takes away one of those slots that are very crucial the menu is very easy to navigate i actually love the ui for this game it builds into the whole cyber aesthetic thing and i i'm all for it it looks so stunning the way the graphics pop out and i do want to clarify that i played the game on ps5 and it looks amazing the only downside that i have is and this isn't really a fault of this game this is a fault on i guess playstation system combined with a capture card is that even though my monitor supports 144 hertz and i can run higher frame rates on the monitor the game won't do it unless i'm connected directly to the monitor because the elgato software doesn't even though it has passed through it won't do it for some reason so i can't play it at higher frame rates and i would love to play this game at higher frame rates but i can't do it and stream it at the same time sorry it's a little side rant that is not a fault on this game it's just something that happens and if i try to play it it crashes on uh, it crashes my uh my elgato software and it's just it's a pain. Elgato, you need to update your stuff. Anyways, side rant over. The game is beautiful. The character models look fantastic on my PS5. I, I have not played this on the PS4 yet. I don't have the PC version. But on my PS5, the character models look stunning. The colors pop out. The character outlines are beautifully done. You don't see any jagged edges on the character models. It's, it's something that, like, that you'd love to see. Because, for example, when I talk about the jagged edges on the outlines of the characters, that's a problem that I saw in Persona 5 Strikers, where the character models had these weird kind of jagged lines that it wasn't so smooth like it was in the original Persona 5. But that also had to do with the fact that Persona 5 Strikers was developed by Koei Tecmo and not in-house by Atlas's team. So, just, I guess, something of a side note but the character models in this look beautiful absolutely beautiful and i'm very impressed by what i what i've seen and how the game has played with the combat and everything and the particle effects with no slowdowns during combat um and, and the frame rates always being solid i'm really impressed especially considering how smt5 was stuck at 30 fps but that was a switch problem that wasn't really the problem of the game now i mentioned the dungeons being kind of repetitive especially the longer that you're in a dungeon and that issue becomes more prevalent as you play through the game because you're spending more and more time within those dungeons so the longer you spend in that said dungeon looking at the same scenery over and over of course it's going to start to get tiresome another thing that's going to get tiresome and this is probably my biggest gripe with this game is Mimi. Mimi is a navigation character in this game that is completely unnecessary and you have no way to turn it off. If you thought Navi in Ocarina of Time was annoying, well guess what? You're going to rip your hair out and be bald like me. I really 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 want atlas to patch this game with the ability to turn mimi off just shut her up 
She is annoying because she repeats the same things over and over again. Imagine RE4 with Ashley screaming Leon help all the time. Except you can't put her in the trash can. You can't make her hide in a dumpster. No, she will always be there saying Leon help over and over again. Yeah, Mimi's that. Mimi is that. Throughout the entire dungeon, she repeats the same things over and over again. And it's very aggravating. So, Atlas, please give us a way to turn Mimi off. That is probably one of the biggest quality of life improvements you can make in this game. Another quality of life improvement, which I really don't care for. I mean, I, I care enough to mention it, but I don't really care... Like, it's not a big deal. It's not a deal breaker for me. Is loading times. The loading times are a little bit slow, even on the PS5. Considering how it's a PS5 and there's not really supposed to be loading times. Especially with a digital copy of the game. So, there are loading times. It's not instant loading or instant, uh, you know, scene one to the next. There are loading times and it is a little slow. Uh, you might as well be playing it on the PS4, although the PS4 might have slower loading times. This is something that Atlas can patch. They can do an update for this because we've seen updates like this be patched out or patched in to get rid of those loading times. Case in point, Last of Us Part 2, the loading times were drastically reduced with the update uh, for the PS5. Um, same thing with Final Fantasy VII Remake with the, with the PS5 update the loading times were basically non-existent. Um, so hopefully Atlas, you watch this and you go ahead and you patch that because that is something that, again, I, I'm not really, I don't care. I don't because I'll toss in a PS1 game and play a game with massive loading times. I don't care, but it's enough to mention it considering how the PS5 is touted as having faster loading times or non-existent loading times because of the SSD. So, Atlas, please, please take advantage of that hardware to be able to do that. Overall, though, I know that I gave, you know, some points right there that were aggravating or annoying, but overall, I really, really enjoy this game. There's a lot of gameplay within this game, and at its core, it is a turn-based RPG that has enough difficulty to it to appease you know, long-term SMT fans, as well as not being overly difficult because it gave you the options and, you know, the option for difficulty and it makes the combat very easy to jump into. So newcomers to the franchise can play this game without any hassle, without any worries. So I'm very glad that there is this SMT game that exists like this and is not on Nocturne levels of difficulty because one of the things that uh, people always say is that SMT, Mainline SMT, is a very difficult franchise, and they're not wrong. But this game is accessible to more people, and I'm all for that because I want more people to enjoy the things that I enjoy. Making new fans. People I can talk to about the games that I enjoy playing. Just like this video. So, I highly recommend you guys check out SMT. Soul Hackers 2. I really, it gets my seal of approval. Go play the game so we can talk about this game because it is so much fun to play. It's got some issues, but no game is perfect. Every game has issues. And if the only update Atlas ever does is to turn off Mimi, I will be 100% okay with that. They won't need to update the game anymore. And I... Oh, speaking of updates really quick. I do want to mention that this game... I had no issues running this game. No day one patch. Because, you know, I got I got a copy early. So there's no day one patch on this game. With no day one patch, this game ran magnificently. There's no crashing. There's no frame rate stutters. There, there's no issues that you get from other games like cyberpunk or last of us part two this game was not delivered broken and i am absolutely happy for that good job atlas now lower the price on that dlc because that's atrocious never release a day one dlc 
for as much as you're doing, Atlas. That's that's a that's a bad company decision right there. I'm gonna harp on you for that. Okay, that's not the fault of the game, I guess. That's an Atlas decision. So I'm just giving everybody here a disclaimer that there is D uh, there is day one DLC. It is expensive. It's like forty bucks if you want all the DLC. Uh, buy it at your own risk. It's not necessary, but here's the problem. One of the DLCs is locked. It, it's story. It's it's story that's locked behind DLC. Instead of cosmetic stuff, you locked a, a story segment behind DLC. That's a bad move, Atlas. Very bad move. But the game itself is a very, very high-quality game. And I appreciate that very much. So take the criticisms. Take my thoughts and opinions. Form your own. You join me on my live streams. I will be streaming this game. There will be gameplay released for this game right after you watch this video. Or right after this video goes live. Or if you're watching this in the future, there's already gameplay on my channel. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Subscribe for more. And I'll see all of you guys in cyberspace. What's our okay. Let's promise Go for I got this one, Saizo. <laughs> Too late for regrets now. Here, pal. What's the plan? Good idea. Take this. One down. Guess I'm out of their league. <laughs>